Good evening. Do you believe in psychic ability? Can you sense what image has been wrapped up behind me here? I'm in the Science Museum, London, and this secret picture, which has been hanging for a week, was drawn by one of the curators. She wrapped it up herself, and she is the only person in the world who knows what it is. So get a pen and loads of paper ready. You are going to take part in a nationwide remote viewing experiment, the largest of its kind. Welcome to the show. This show fuses magic, suggestion, psychology, misdirection, and showmanship. Good evening. Millions of dollars were spent in the 60s and 70s by America and Russia to develop superhuman powers as part of a psychic arms race that ran alongside the Cold War. And tonight, we revive some of that bizarre research. I'm in the Science Museum in London, and upstairs, wrapped up in newspaper, is a simple design of some sort, drawn in secret by a lady called Katie, who's a curator of this world-famous museum. Only she knows what it is. I have no idea myself. But is it possible for you, as a nation of viewers, to somehow sense what the design is behind that newspaper? For seven days, people were able to come and see the picture and draw what they think it is, and online, people have been able to do the same thing, and arriving now, I have a crowd who are ready to try it for themselves. This is an experiment into a psychic skill known as remote viewing. To take part at home, you're going to need a pen and plenty of paper and something to rest on. And as you watch the show tonight, we're going to keep a shot of the hidden design on the screen. So start now to get a sense of what it is. I can't influence you. I don't know what it is myself. Before we do this, though, there's much to show you about this kind of psychic phenomenon and where it came from. And our story starts with a box of bricks. Thank you. Thank you. Don't look at me. No eye contact. Do not make eye contact. Thank you. Uh, let me. Um, thank you. Let me ask you. Hello. What's your name? Kaylee. Kaylee, if you come up here for me, and you say you are Luke. 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 Let me bring you around here and ask you to come around this side for me, Luke. Thank you very much indeed. So we have a crate, a big wooden crate uh, here, and the crate is full of bricks. It's got so many bricks in that you can't lift it, so you will not be able to lift it, but I'm going to ask you to try anyway, OK? Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, and your job is to try and guess how many bricks you think are in there that would make it impossible to lift. Let me just give you a brick first of all, so you can sense the size and weight and shape of an individual brick. There's one there for you. OK? So, OK, let me just start with you. Grab a handle on that side and a handle on this side over here. OK, just really try. That's good. Really, really straight. OK, up a little bit. That's as far as it's going to go, yes? Do you want to drop it, put it back down? How many? 20, 30, 100? Yeah. 30. 30, <laughs> about 30 bricks or so like that. Actually, why don't you both try together? So you take the handle there again. You take the handles on that side. Now, as you try, as I said, it's going to keep pushing down, but just the more you try, just try and lift it. How many in there? How many in there, Luke, do you think? 20. 10, 10, 10 more than that, presumably 100? 100? 100? 100. OK, all right, put it back down again. Thank you very much. All right. OK, so 100, 200, something like that. Maybe you're thinking about 30. Now, we're going to try and remove... I will remove half of the bricks, thus making it lighter. All right? I will remove half the bricks. Watch. Half the bricks are now gone. Take hold of the handles on your side, take hold of the handles on your side. You'll be able to lift it a little bit more, so just try again. Try hard, try hard. You can lift it up a bit. Good, good. Let me take another half of the bricks away. Gone again. It gets lighter and lighter each time they do that, getting lighter. What's this like? <laughs> lighter, getting lighter. Uh, keep, keep lifting, keep lifting it, keep lifting. I'm taking away half the bricks each time. I'm keep lifting, keep lifting, gets lighter and lighter and lighter and up and up. Keep lifting it as high as it'll go, as high as it'll go. On the count of three, I'll clap my hands, the bricks are going to come back. Please mind your feet as it comes crashing down. One, two, three. <laughs> Excellent, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> thank, you too. thank you, thank you, thank you. What you've seen, what you've just seen there is a piece of propaganda used uh, 150 years ago by a French magician called Robert Houdin to convince some Algerian Arabs that the French had uh, superpowers, like being able to take away someone's strength. 
as opposed to just being snotty. And because that was 150 years ago and being done with a, a fairly unsophisticated group of people, perhaps you might think, well, that sort of thing would never work again today. But the thinking of the magician has always been part of propaganda. Let me show you this. In 1968, the Russian KGB leaked a piece of footage as propaganda to the CIA. And the Americans were terrified because it suggested that the Russians had learned to harness the human mind as a weapon. And this led to the CIA uh, reacting by doing their own psychic research. And then this extraordinary kind of psychic arms race developed for uh, 20 years, costing uh, millions and millions of dollars. I'm going to show you the footage that kicked all this off. And uh, this is a woman called Nina Kolagina, and she is moving a, uh, a compass needle using her psychic ability. Have, have a look. There we are. Actually, just pause it just for a second. The fact that this is weird old grainy silent footage immediately makes it seem much more plausible, like it might be science, like it might be really happening, uh, which may be true. She might absolutely be doing this for real, or she may have magnets in her bra. <laughs> All I'm saying is just, just bear that in mind as you, as you carry on watching this. <clears throat> there you go. I think the magnetics theory holds. And our nipples repel each other as well, which is another clue. Um, oh, look at this bulb at the end uh, flickering out is interesting as well. Now, you've all brought light bulbs with you. We asked you to bring bulbs from home. Get your bulbs out. I want to see them. What's interesting is that the whole, that flickering light bulb thing has remained with us. It's become part of the magician's myth, you know, the idea that a psychic or a magician has this kind of energy that makes light bulbs flicker. You see it in films when the satanic antagonist enters a room and the zzz, you know, the lights flicker above him. Uh, let me try this with, where's that, is that, uh, is that from home? Is that one of yours from home or yeah. did you, yeah? yeah? Actually, no one's touched it, you, no. that is definitely your yeah. bulb. Actually, what's your name? Michael. Michael, yeah. would you head up with me? Thank you, Michael. Give Michael a hand. <laughs> If you can uh, put yourself there. Thank you, Michael. And um, I'm going to ask you, can you initial that sort of metal base of the, um, yeah. of the bulb? And on both sides as well, just so you can keep your eye on that and you'll know that it will remain your bulb throughout. These metal bases on light bulbs, sadly, are not magnetic, so my special bra won't do me any good today. <laughs> we should be wearing it anyway, just in case. Thank you. Um, pop that there. So, Michael, if you... If you um, sort of forget about all the kind of fake mm -hmm. psychics and charlatans. The fact is we're hardwired to convince ourselves of these kind of beliefs. The moment you start to entertain the idea of a psychic belief, then instead of laying dormant on the table like your bulb here, it starts to gain its own momentum. And then we start looking for evidence that backs up what we already believe. And that makes us just believe it even more. And uh, that's what we call a circular belief. <laughs> Please check it. There's nothing attached. Pick it up and have a look at it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, if you hold it in, actually, uh, hold, hold both hands out. If you take it, no, no, uh, so you can hold the base of it like that. Okay. Just up like that. That's great. What happens is eventually, you end up sort of taking hold of this belief. It becomes part of your values. It sort of becomes your thing. And it means that instead of sort of worrying about, oh, is this all there is to life, you can end up taking a deep breath in and letting this belief in rubbish become your guiding light. Become something that uh, you want to share with everybody else, regardless of whether or not they want to hear about it. And I think it takes real guts, Michael, to be able to take that belief and to be able to sit back and kind of look at it from a different perspective. Something you can look at that you can even isolate. Actually, if you, can you open the bag up for me? Thank you, drop that in there. Thank you. Like that. So you can isolate the belief and you can look at it in isolation. You can kind of contain it and study it and think to yourself, is that something that has any basis in reality at all? And if not, should I be making major life decisions based on it? And you can get really close up to it and examine it and question it and question it. And if you're brave enough, maybe you can just uh, let it go. <laughs> With a big bang. Alakazam. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.
So, to be clear, I do not believe in psychic ability, and my attempt at remote viewing tonight does not rely on the paranormal. So with that in mind, let's look at what I had to do to prepare for tonight. I asked Katie, the curator, to draw something simple, like a design or a simple picture. Here's what happened. Hello, Katie. Hi, nice Hello. to meet you. Hello. Thank you so lovely to meet you too. Thank you so much for doing this. So you're a curator at the Science Museum. Yeah, that's right. And you've kindly lent us yourself for this experiment. Thank you very much. So I'm going to give you this, which is a big board and some uh, black paint and a brush, and I'm going to ask you to go and paint something on this. Now, the only limitation I'm going to give you, please, is that it's something that's going to be um, relatively simple, a kind of a design of some sort. I'd like you to go home and do it uh, so that you know nobody could possibly be seeing what you're doing. So lock yourself away, draw the curtains, hide in the cupboard, whatever you like. Make sure nobody sees it. When you've done it, don't tell anybody what it is that you've painted. I want you to keep it yourself. Then you're going to wrap it up in newspaper mm -hmm. and then you're going to bring it to the Science Museum. And I'd also ask you maybe to um, change your mind a few times before you actually start painting so that you know that nobody could possibly know what you've painted and that that is a decision you're making just at that moment. Does that make sense? Thank you very much, Lee. Well, there's your, I'll put the your brush and paint. In the very box. good. Have fun. I'll do my best. And good luck. All right, and thanks. entirely up to you what you paint. Thank okay. you so much. Thank Bye. you. Well, your security guard will give you a hand there. Thank you so much, Katie. You can come down and join thanks. me, please. Thanks, Thank you. Hello, thank you I very much. Again. Well done, well done. So nobody saw you draw the picture as well. I take it you locked yourself away at home and... Absolutely, nobody's seen it, not with my boyfriend. And obviously you're not going to tell anybody what it is either. Fantastic. Now, this is going to be sealed off. Tell us about the security you have in this place. Absolutely. Well, the bridge is going to be secured for the next week, so nobody's going to be on there. And then the museum has 24-hour security um, and cameras on all the time, so no one's going to be able to tamper with it in any kind of way. And this, after all, is probably one of the most secure buildings in the country, I would, Absolutely. I would imagine. Absolutely. And that's going to sit there for a week, uh, during which people will be able to come here to the museum and stand here, look at it, and draw what they think it is, uh, to read your mind. Uh, and, uh, well, here is Katie. Now, Katie's the only person who knows what's there, and she's in an isolation tank in a secret location. Now, she's currently blindfolded, and she doesn't know where she is. Uh, but let's talk to her now. Katie, can you hear me? Yeah, hello, Darren. <laughs> hello, nice to see you. I know you can't see us. You can take your blindfold off now. Now, you're going to have a bit of a light shining in okay. your eyes, so just be aware. It might take your eyes a little while to adjust. You don't know where you are, do you? I've got no idea where I am. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. This is basically working like an isolation tank, and you being disorientated in this way, not knowing where you are, it actually does make you a little more suggestible, and it'll make your job easier of mentally projecting the thought that you're going to have. So there's a good reason for this, so thank you for bearing with us. Excellent. Now, keeping an eye on proceedings tonight, we have a team of scientists from the museum who are here to make sure that the experiment is all conducted fairly. Hello. Hello. And uh, this is our crowd. Now, you're going to have the same instructions as everyone at home, just to relax and draw whatever comes to mind. It's very important I have not given you any guidance on what to draw, correct? Yeah. Great. Lovely. Thank you. All right. So, at home, let's begin remote viewing now. Katie, I'd like to talk to you for a moment. Can you hear me again, Katie? Yeah, hi, Darren. OK, we're going to begin the process now, Katie. So your instructions are this. We're going to focus in very uh, closely on your eyes. And what I want you to do now, in your mind, Katie, is to begin to mentally project the image that you've drawn. If you have drawn something that is fairly abstract, it will help you if you find things that in your mind that it maybe looks like or resembles. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. OK, fantastic. So Katie, just be doing that now. Start mentally projecting that image across the nation and to these people here. At home and here in the museum, you are now about to remote view. Everybody here as well, take a deep breath in, let it out and relax. Now imagine an image of the British Isles on a thin sheet of paper like a newspaper in front of you. Now that image is whisked away and on the next sheet of newspaper, it's an image of the south of England. That is whisked away and on the next sheet you can see London and on the next, the Science Museum and on the next, this room and on the next, a big close-up image of that package with a newspaper around it. Start drawing whatever comes to mind now. You as well here behind me. For a week people have been doing this in the museum and you are now doing it too. The crowd here are starting to draw as well. Don't think about it. You're going to be drawing whatever comes to mind 
find shapes and designs throughout the commercial break. The ads will actually distract your conscious mind and allow your unconscious, that is the deeper part of you, to come up with ideas. So keep drawing on several sheets. Don't sense yourself. Don't worry about being specific. Remember, it is just a simple design, so it's likely to be shapes interacting somehow. But if it makes you think of anything in particular, write that down too underneath. So keep drawing, and we'll see you in a moment. Stop drawing if you haven't already. You've just played your part in a great big television first. You have just joined with the nation and people here in the psychic skill of remote viewing. So people here are now bringing up their drawings and uh, Katie, you can stop concentrating now on your mental image. We're gonna turn off your sound just for the moment. So you can't hear us, we will speak to you later. Thank you if you took part. You have all drawn what your unconscious mind has suggested that the picture is. And we have a team of independent adjudicators who will be sorting through the pictures that people have drawn uh, here tonight to see which pictures have come up the most. As well, of course, as those left by visitors here in this glass box over the course of a week. At home then as well, please spread out in front of you what you've drawn so you can see everything there too. Guys, can we get this um, box emptied out please so we can see what's in there? Ever so big and strong. Meanwhile, aside from remote viewing, the psychic arms race led the CIA to look into the idea of sleeper assassins. These were innocent people who could be programmed to commit crimes, such as assassinations, without realising. And I took that as the inspiration for this next piece. I wanted to take a member of the public who had no idea that he was being targeted and see if I could make him do something completely unexpected and out of character, possibly even break the law. This small cafe was the perfect size to find the target. Rigged with hidden cameras, including a camera in my glasses, it was just a matter of time before someone came in. My idea is to use a technique called mirroring. This will enable me to have some control over their actions. The first stage of mirroring involves trying to copy the other person's body movements so that we get into sync with each other. It often takes several attempts before I find the right person. It wasn't her. Once I'm mirroring them, I'll try to lead their actions so that they're copying my actions without being aware of it. After a while, a third person appears. After 20 minutes, I've got this guy in sync with me, so now I'm going to try and lead his actions. He is now copying me without realizing it, and I'm going to try and make him feel sleepy. Sleeper agents were used by both sides during the Cold War, the ultimate goal being to control the minds of these agents in order to get them to do something illegal, which is what I'm going to attempt here. There are two things for you to unplug on the TV. The little red girl is your trigger. I pay for his coffee and leave. We follow him using hidden cameras as he walks up London's Tottenham Court Road, best known for its large number of electronic shops. The little red girl is your trigger.
Although the shop's manager had been pre-warned, the shop assistants had no idea what we were doing. So to avoid the police being called, I gave the TV back to its rightful owners. I was walking down the street and I saw quite a nice television that I liked in that, in that shop. And uh, I, I thought I'd pick it up and, and, and get it. I saw a man in front with the TV there and he happened to sort of be fiddling with it, looking at it. Before I could ask him for help, he had disconnected everything from the TV and he just walked out. Thank you very much. And uh, we have our shoplifter somewhere at the back, so uh, feel free to chat to him later. The other element of the CIA's wasted psychic research was remote viewing. And remote viewing is the ability to uh, see and describe an object that actually is completely hidden. Uh, and it was of interest to the CIA because to them it meant that they might be able to read uh, a secret document that's locked into a box or even, as was also claimed, to be able to see through someone else's eyes. So you could be in Washington, and you could be looking through the eyes of a government minister in Russia and describe what it was that he's looking at. Now, it's also of great interest to me because, of course, I know I can sort of approximate that kind of effect, but without using psychic ability. So in researching this, I came across this next guy that I want to introduce you to. He is probably the world's foremost expert on remote viewing. He does it himself, he trains people in it, and he absolutely claims that he can look through somebody else's eyes and describe what it is that they're looking at. So, we flew him over, we asked him to demonstrate, and I was really intrigued to see what the results were. We've come to a quiet part of London to meet with a man called Dr. Carr. He believes he can see places and objects across space and time, and also says he has the extraordinary ability to enter the mind of another human being using his skill of remote viewing. Dr. Carl, thank you so much for flying over to be with us today. Looking into remote, remote viewing, your name has come up again and again and again, so perhaps you just talk us through your, your credentials and, and, and what it is that you do. I have a uh, private practice as a psychologist, mm -hmm. and I also teach remote viewing, okay. including the military remote viewers. There's still a debate going on whether remote viewing is real or not. Uh, I think anyone who does his homework will find out that there is ample evidence to support it. So, under controlled conditions, we invited Dr. Carr to take part in an experiment. Right now, somewhere across town, is Lauren. I've asked her to choose a location and go there and not tell me anything about it. Once Lauren has arrived, she will be asked to call me so Dr. Carr can begin the lengthy process of filling out over a hundred pages of information that he will receive during the remote viewing process. Here we are. Here she is. Lovely ringtone. Hello, is that Lauren? Hello, yeah, I'm here. Hello, it's Darren. Um, so you've, you've arrived at your location. Thank you, Lauren. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. There you go, she's there. Over to you. Neither Dr. Carr nor I have any idea where Lauren is, and now that she's arrived, Dr. Carr will attempt to see through her eyes and discover her location. To do this, he begins a process of filling out over a hundred pages of information with drawings and words that he believes he's receiving from Lauren. Arch, steps, temple, downstairs, garden, fence, chain, gazing, a circular, Sense of stones on top of each other. Sense of looking this out. leads to Dr. Carr entering her body in an act he calls blending. I'm going to try to blend with Lauren a little bit right now. One of the ways I can do it, I can put Lauren in front of me and I can step inside her body and describe what I see. I feel like I'm sitting, my legs are dangling a little bit. It's almost like I can see a boat too from where I am too. I want to do that for a second. I may be way off. <laughs> okay. 
so, after an hour and a half of writing hundreds of words and drawings and having entered Lauren's body, Dr. Carr has arrived at what he believes is a series of possible images of Lauren's location. Okay. Wow. <laughs> what a marathon. So oh, let's invite her back and find out where she's Hello. been. Right, uh, your your time is up. You can now stop. <laughs> you can now stop staring. Thank you very much for this. I'd like you to head back. Hello. Let's sit yourself down. Could you read to Lauren your the sort of the final those final pages that were sort of okay. felt like a summation. Well, also, of... I can just yeah summarize. There seemed to be almost maybe a church-like or something that was relaxing about it. There, and there, perhaps a garden nearby or. Possibly. Yeah, old brick stones, some kind of tower, also a sense of water or fountain or some kind of movement. Also, art. People could go inside. It was very, it was inviting. I think we're ready to see what it is. Let's have a look then. Um, it's actually a fountain. Okay, so and a sculpture, art. yeah. Okay. The horses of uh, Helios. Yeah, I'm not saying I totally nailed it. in one of your drawings, there's like four objects. So this might be my closest representation, even though it's very fuzzy. But the description is correct in our round sculpture water. Do you feel 50-50? Do you feel uh, almost 100%? I'd say it was over 50%. Over 50%? Is it way but we'll give, give, give it a percentage. Maybe, no, like 55, 60, because okay. I think some, some key information was picked out. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Intriguing, maybe plausible, perhaps. Of course, you are seeing an edited version there. You are seeing the version that a TV program would show you when they are showing somebody demonstrating psychic ability. I, of course, was sat there for the whole hour and a half and filling out 100 sheets of paper, and I was a bit more skeptical. So what I wanted to do is take an objective viewpoint and see how accurate he really was. So first of all, the picture that he showed at the end. He actually showed about five, five pictures in the end he, he uh, came up with, and they were all fairly ambiguous and you can draw your own conclusions from that. And the one picture he did pick out there, which was this one, kind of looks maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit like the fountain, but of course he focused on that one after Lauren had told him what it was that she was looking at. In terms of what he said, the descriptions that he gave, um, to his credit, he did say fountain-like. That's something he did say once during the uh, process. And also six times, he said, and six was the largest number of times he gave any specific description, he did say wet. But also six times, he said boat-like and church-like, which kind of would be wrong. And when you go back over the hour and a half and pull out all the specific descriptions that he said, you realize <laughs> that it kind of covers everything. That you could take any landmark in London or any other historic city and you could kind of make it fit. Now, this is no reflection on Dr. Carr. He's a very nice chap. I'm sure he's, he's very sincere, which is why I've taken this and I formed from it my own version of remote viewing, which I'm going to be doing later on in this program, and I hope, I hope, with much, much clearer results. Well, the drawings are being sorted, and uh, we've got the ones over here on this table that have been done this evening, and on this table are the drawings that were left in the glass box by visitors to the museum. And everything is also being overseen by the staff and the scientists at the museum, just to make sure that everything is genuinely fair and square. Now, once we've filtered out the cocks, the question will be, will the pictures that have been drawn here this evening and those drawn by visitors to the museum and those drawn by you at home bear any relation to what Katie drew? We'll find out very soon. For the first time on television, we are conducting a nationwide remote viewing experiment to see if you can sense what image or design is behind that newspaper. For a week, people have left their guesses here in the Science Museum. This evening, you at home have put yourselves to the test, trying to see through the eyes of our curator, along with a crowd here in the museum. So I've asked a museum scientist to have a look and pick out any drawings that uh, seem to be coming up more than the others. So, uh, Rob, will you join us for a second and tell us what you found? First of all, what's your job here? You are the... Uh... I'm Assistant Creator of Technology. Very nice to meet you. Thank right. you. I guess that's why you don't have to wear the orange yeah. T-shirt with the others. So what have you got there, Rob? What are the ones that are coming up more than others? Well, we've got vehicles, particularly trains. There's a train there, quite nicely drawn. OK. Uh, quite a few concentric circles. 
Yes, I was going to say spirals. Concentric circles. Yeah. Uh, yes, okay. Quite a few that look a little bit like Stonehenge. You're getting quite a lot of these? Yes. Okay. And then, out of all the animals, mostly horses. So you're getting quite a... I expect a few animals, but horses? Mostly I, horses. Okay, I'd imagine dogs and cats would be. Are getting a lot of dogs and cats as well? No, mostly horses. Mostly horses. Now this... Okay, now these are fairly unusual in terms of what I imagine most people would draw. Thank you very much indeed. Nice. Thank you so much. Please do, uh, do carry on. So, perhaps one of these feels right to you at home. So try repeating the exercise and letting your hand draw again and see if it comes up with one of these four things. Now, if you do find yourself drawing one of these now, or if you see that one of these is already in your drawings that you've already done at home, please let us know. We'll put as many text messages on screen as possible. Text events, followed by your message or what you've drawn, and your name and your hometown to 84444. And we'll be back soon with the results. But while you start to text us, I want you to move from the various Cold War phenomena to the specific skill of remote viewing and how somebody sceptical of psychic ability like me could make sense of it. And we began with a little game. This is Priscilla. She has an unusual job as a court illustrator which involves retaining strong images of faces as she's only allowed to draw them when she's left the courtroom. I thought she'd be ideal for playing my version of Guess Who. OK, so Priscilla, we're going to play a giant game of Guess Who. I'm going to ask you to face this way and uh, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes as well because there's a few okay. windows around, I don't want you catching mm -hmm. the reflection. Um, so stay there for one second for me. OK, so I'm going to want a few volunteers in the group. If you want to do this, could you just put your hand up? Uh, OK, hands down. I think you'll be perfect for this. Let me bring you forward. Priscilla has no idea who I've selected. I'm hoping that in the next few minutes, she's going to be able to gradually imagine the face of the person I've picked who's standing behind her. So, Priscilla, in a moment, this uh, person behind you who still has a sack over uh, his or her head is going to place his or her hand on the back of your shoulder. As you feel that happen, I want you to begin in your mind to form what we're going to call your face image that you're going to form in your mind. And I would say do it very, very slowly. So you're going to begin just with a, a vague, shapeless blob, and very slowly as we go on, we'll, we'll begin to turn it into a, into a distinct face. So just fingertips, just there. I'm going to only ask you yes or no questions. According to Priscilla's answers, all of you uh, will be listening, please, to her answers and eliminating yourself if need be. So the first question I'm going to ask is, uh, is this person um, a man? Now, if Priscilla says yes, then we will continue with the men and all the women will eliminate themselves. And when you eliminate yourself, please just take your bag off your head, first of all, and then I'll ask all those, all those people that, uh, eliminated to go and stand at the back. So, Priscilla, your first question so you're going to answer nice and clearly, yes or no. As you begin to form this face image in your mind, is this person a man, yes or no? No. No, that is a no. OK, so if you are a man, please take your sack off because you are eliminated. Thank you, and uh, nothing has happened to you at the front, which is uh, good. We can tell that Priscilla was right in that answer. Our mystery person has not been eliminated, so Priscilla is correct so far. The moment this person is eliminated, we'll know Priscilla has made a mistake. Yeah, Priscilla, I'm going to ask you to turn round and face our target individual. Continue in your mind, and you can do this with your eyes open or eyes closed, I don't mind, to form this face image and just slowly bring this together to form a face. All right. Priscilla, does this person, does this face image that you're forming, does it have dark hair? No. No. If you have dark hair, and this applies to all of you, take your sack off your head now. Sacks off, and sack off to the back of the room. Thank you. Dark hair have been eliminated, and men have been eliminated. Correct again. Our mystery person is still in the game. Priscilla, does this person have her hair tied back? Yes. Yes, we have a yes. So if your hair is not tied back, I'm afraid you are now eliminated from the game. Please remove your sack if your hair is not tied back. Again, good. No movement here at the front. Excellent. We're now down to just two people. Amazingly, Priscilla has eliminated 29 people and the mystery person is still there. And now there are only two people left. Can she get the very last question right? 
Has this person, yes or no, last question, would you say this person has long earrings? No. Okay, if you've got long earrings, you are good. Well, that's, that's, yes, you can take your sack off. Thank you very much. Head back to your place at the back. So this leaves one lady at the front. You've got everything right so far. Now, before we take the sack off this lady's head, I'm now intrigued to know exactly what image you have in your mind of this. So I'm gonna ask you to draw a picture of this face image that you've sort of built up during this process. This is step-by-step -step remote viewing. If I'd have asked Priscilla to somehow describe an unseen face in one go, it would have seemed impossible to her. But doing it piece by piece allows for an image and her confidence to grow in tiny baby steps. As you were forming this image, what colour eyes you left? You said quite light. They're blue. The colour hair, I think you said, was blonde, wasn't it? Any earrings at all? Any jewellery, uh, do you think? Yes. Stud earrings. Stud earrings. Hair tied back. Hair tied back, stud earrings. I mean, I haven't been giving you any clues as we've been doing this. You haven't been aware of me giving you any hints or clues as we've been doing it, no. So you're happy this has really genuinely come out of your own mind, yes? Yes. <laughs> that's it, that's extraordinary. Wow. So, stud earrings? Yeah. Yes, can we see those? Large blue eyes, definitely, if yeah, strikingly really so. Good. And you've... You've definitely even got the mouth and the chin slight. That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. What's your name? Sinead. Sinead, thank you very thank much, you. Sinead. Thank you. And Priscilla, thank you too. Thank you. Well, I was imagining the shape of her face, and then I was imagining that shock of blonde hair. I was thinking about her big blue eyes, stud earrings, and then that her hair was pulled back. I saw the girl that I was imagining, and that was amazing. I was quite amazed because she'd never seen me before, obviously. I believe it could be to do with psychic abilities because it's obviously it looks very much like me, which is obviously a bit freaky. And, uh, and we do have Priscilla with us um, tonight. So, Priscilla, well done. Congratulations. Fantastic. Excellent. Priscilla, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for that. Now, because Dr. Carr's test was kind of inconclusive, I wanted to look into a different area. And it was rumoured that the CIA uh, tried out remote viewing using blind people. Partly because it obviously meant they couldn't cheat by looking, but it also, uh, there's this idea of if, you've, if there's one sense that you're not using, then your other senses become heightened. Now, in my research into this, I came across this next chap that I want to introduce you to, who is extraordinary. His name is Daniel Kish. He's been blind since he was tiny, but he has developed an extraordinary and genuine skill uh, which has its parallels in remote viewing. So have a look at this, because this guy is remarkable. Daniel, real pleasure to meet you. Good to meet you. Thank you for flying over from LA. Uh, can you just talk us through what your work is and how you spend your time? We uh, teach people how to perceive their environment the same way that a bat perceives its environment. Mm. We learn to issue a sound, which could be a tongue click, and that sound goes out and it bounces off of everything in the environment and it comes back. Now you're going to demonstrate this to us, so let's just talk a little bit about your own situation. I am totally blind. Both eyes were removed um, by 13 months of age and I have no visual memory. So my perception of space and perception of the world um, comes entirely through touch and through hearing. Bring me bring you over this way. I'm taking Daniel to somewhere he has never been before. He's going to show us how just by making a clicking sound from his mouth and without using his cane, he can perceive the physical world around him in amazing detail. So you've got maybe a tree that's lost all of its leaves uh, or Wait a second now. Okay, now I take that all back. Okay, so you've got a wall there, and then you have an entryway here. Ah. So basically, so this goes between the wall and something else. Yes. Let me just see what we have here. You can go between here.
Okay, there's something way over there, and it's a, it's a textured building, so there are alcoves, I can, I can hear colonnades. Uh, so Daniel, we brought you to a, a car. You were confident you'd be able to give us a sense of the shape of the car and to describe uh, its, its contours. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, I think so. So, all right, so we're starting with the bonnet. It's fairly low, fairly low bonnet. And then it kind of, then it kind of comes up, across the top, across the top, across the top, across the top. And then it starts to stop right there and it comes down at a fairly steep angle, but not straight down. There you go. That's, uh, <laughs> that's the car. It's difficult for me to understand how you'd have such a spatial sense of a wall or a, or a car of exactly that shape, but not a visual thing that you're putting in that space at the same time. So I, I suppose you it's... Might, you might think of it like being in a choir or in an orchestra or near um, a, a, a performance where you have many, many, many things going on all, all at one time. Mm. And if you're listening, you really have that sense of surrounding, of sound surrounding you. And so what I often tell people mm. is that the world is really like a living symphony. Every sound made in the world and every texture presented in the world carries its own meaning. This car, in a sense, is kind of like an instrument, except that instead of making its own sound, it's reflecting sounds that I'm making. It's been an extraordinary <clears throat> afternoon spending time with you. Thank you so much for coming along and sharing your wisdom and your you. expertise with us. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Daniel's skills are real, remarkable, and appear to be magic. And if the remote viewing experiment works tonight here and across Britain, it is down to a combination of all of the things that I've shown you this evening. Now it's time to look at the results. Here we go. I've got the two adjudicators here uh, with me. Now, you were looking after the table with all the pictures from the last week in the glass box. You were looking after the ones from the people here tonight. So, I'll start with you because you've already shown us a few of the ones that were coming up overall. Yeah, we had over a thousand drawings. Yes. And we, most popular was at 35%. We had about 35% uh, concentric circles. Uh, and then after that, about 10% of Stonehenge drawings. 35% is actually a huge amount. To Massive. Bear in mind, people could draw anything. Yes. Well, that's okay. That's remarkable. So that's the people for the last week. How did it go in this um, in this lot from people here tonight? We actually had similar things. We had 91 entries tonight. Yes. And 30% of them were concentric circles again. So concentric circles is by far the most popular. Yeah. With an amazing 30%, give or take. You were 30, a little bit more, 35%. Excellent. Well, thank you both. Um, it is extraordinary so far. Just to remind you, of course, at home, that Katie can't hear any of this. She's got no idea what's been going on here in this room. So the question is, of course, what have you drawn at home? So please have a look back through your drawings. Have you drawn concentric circles as well? And if you have, text us events, then your message and your name and town to 84444. But of course, all of this means nothing until we see what image Katie has drawn. So after the break, that is exactly what we're going to do. Weeks ago, Katie drew a picture in secret at her home with no one else around. She wrapped it up securely and hung it here in the Science Museum, one of the most secure venues in the country. The picture has been guarded and surrounded by the museum's 24-hour security cameras. It is sealed up, no one could have tampered with it, and Katie has not told a soul what it is. Now, I've asked people here, visitors to the gallery and you at home to draw what you think it is, and we have had the same drawing come up again and again here, concentric circles. So let's talk to Katie now. Katie, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you, Darren. Fantastic. Now, you haven't been hearing what's been going on really up to this point, have you? Not at all, no. Not at all. Well, listen, Katie, we've had the same drawing come up again and again and again. Now, I'm going to tell you what it is, but I don't want you to react, OK? It might be right or wrong. What I do want you to do, though, is just to quietly in your head think about whether or not it relates to what it was that you drew. We're not expecting this to be an exact match or an exact description of what you drew, but hopefully it will relate to it in some way. Does that make sense to you, first of all? Yep, it does. OK, but please don't react, don't give anything away as to whether or not you think this is right or not. But what almost 30% of people have drawn is a set of concentric circles over and over again. OK? You heard that? Yep, heard that. 
With that in mind, we are now going to undo your painting, and these people here are going to find out, and people at home are going to find out for the first time what it is that you actually drew. So um, let's do it. Michael, can you open the painting for us? Let's have a look. Michael is removing the barrier, making his way to the painting. Can you reach up there, Michael? Let's see what Katie drew. first can you just verify what it was that you drew uh, Katie I drew uh, three concentric circles three concentric circles and I think you signed it as well how did you sign it uh, with the KM KM you initialed it at the side and can I ask you as you were sat there thinking of this you, you did a great job it obviously worked whatever you're doing was fine were you what were you thinking in your mind were you just picturing them as circles or were you turning them into various pictures what were you sort of picturing um, a target, a uh, Stonehenge, which what the little dashes were on my picture. So, <laughs> what? S Stonehenge? Yeah, absolutely, Stonehenge. Viewed from above, presumably? Yeah, viewed from above, above with um, the little sort of dashes of the stones. <laughs> well, everybody here, I don't know what everyone here is thinking, but the most popular drawn thing was concentric circles. That was 30%. About 10% of people drew Stonehenge. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, this has been extraordinary. I think it's been a, a great success, but thank you, Katie. Thank you so very much indeed. A round of applause for Katie. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Extraordinary. Now, thank you for taking part. Now, you should be able to now see on the screen results coming in from viewers at home. And if this has worked, a lot of them should be saying concentric circles. I don't know if that's worked because we're recording this about three weeks before this show goes out. So now that I know Katie has drawn concentric circles, I now have plenty of time to persuade you at home to do the same thing. So I'm going to put into every major daily newspaper on the 25th of September a tiny advert telling you to draw concentric circles. And today, as you're watching the show, if you flick through your newspaper, you will have unconsciously picked up on that instruction. On the screen now, we'll be showing you the papers and the pages in those papers where I will place the instruction in the form of a small classified ad. If you've drawn anything resembling concentric circles tonight, now you know why. Now, as for why so many people here got it, uh, who knows? And uh, as for what you might have imagined those concentric circles to be, well, that's up to you. Katie pictured them as Stonehenge, and loads of people here amazingly did pick up on Stonehenge too. Now, maybe that is just a bizarre coincidence. I'm going to leave that to you to decide. Uh, thank you for taking part. Uh, Katie, I'm so sorry. You still don't even know where you are, do you? No, nope, not at all. No, well, uh, you can come out now. Thank you so much. You can come out and get some fresh air. <laughs> Stonehenge. <laughs>
suggestion, psychology, misdirection and showmanship. I achieve all the results you'll see through a varied mixture of those techniques. At no point are actors or stooges used in this show. I thought it would be fun to teach somebody else my skills for a small charge. Look at that, just giving a little something back. You just do it for the, the faces on the children. What's your name? Marie. Marie, okay, now I think you'll be brilliant at this. Come over here. All right, you're going to read someone's mind. It's 5p, you happy to do this? Okay, 5p, please. Thank you very much. You need someone's mind to read? Um, guy there with the hat? You two have never met before. You don't know each other. No, all right. I'm going to ask you to think of, uh, do you have a password on your computer or something like that? Yeah. Are you happy for us to say what it is? You can always go yeah, and change yeah. it after. You haven't been asked to tell anybody what that is or anything like that, OK? Now, I'm going to tell Marie how to do this. So I'm just going to ask you to sort of face it away. Yeah, sure. Talk to, this, talk to these guys there. They're very chatty. All right, all right. <laughs> all right so you're going to start. Yeah. You didn't hear any of that, did you? No. no, good. Now you have to take control here. So just put your fingers up there. Is it? Is it just? It's not just a mix of random letters no. and things. Is it? It's actually a word. Okay, great. Okay, tell him what you want him to do. You want him to repeat it in his head over and over Keep again. Keep repeating the word in your head over and over. Now really send it to her. Imagine that you can just transmit it to Marie here. All right. Mm. So in your mind, you're screaming it at her. What letters feel right? B. Okay. Does that make sense? Does it begin with a B or is there a B in it that's a, a, a prominent letter? Yeah, okay, great. You're doing well. Keep going. I N G The bird. What, have you got an image at all? A picture or anything? Yeah. He's grinning, so I think you're close to, you're close to right. Yeah, um... Like a bird um, singing. Yeah. Is that close? Are we close? Songbird. Is it, is it something to do with the bird singing? Yeah, that's the one. Song yeah, yeah. Songbird. Songbird? Yeah. That is your password, yeah. songbird. songbird. Just straight oh up. <laughs> Get away from that one. I was just walking by and I was just asked to come on and Your met this guy. Happened. The word just came into my head and I just I can't believe it's true. I can't believe that's the word. I don't know how that's done. That's what I'm saying. All I did was just stand there with my fingers on his temples and just somehow, just by staring at him, it just suddenly he popped into my head. And I was just like saying songbird in my head, songbird, songbird. That's just baffling. I just can't believe it. I'm just <laughs> so shocked. Really, I'm shocked. <laughs> We all get stuck in our belief systems, however sensible we think they are. To me, the New Age community is particularly guilty of not testing or challenging what it claims. And it was with this in mind that I invited a young woman to Epping Forest. Just here? Yeah, yeah. This is really nice here, isn't it? Lovely. <laughs> Can I talk to you a bit about what your beliefs are in in terms of spirituality. With something like uh, Reiki or psychic healing or crystal healing, if you don't think it's just a question of you, you sort of buy into it and believe in it and then it sort of works because you're expecting to, if you think it genuinely is more than that, how do you, how do you sort of grasp that? I've experienced uh, crystal healing. Um, I've experienced um, Reiki, All right. uh, which is using universal energy. Um, which probably a lot of people would be very skeptical to believe in, sure. and, and you know. But I'm basing my beliefs in facts, you know, and the things that I have seen how they've created a progress in my life, or how things have shifted. I've seen this well, the results, you know. Mm -hmm. There is something I'd like uh, to try with you, and this is why I, I got you here specifically to talk about belief. And it uses an area of belief that I don't know, maybe is less fashionable than some of the beliefs that have been adopted in our culture now, as mainstream religion seems to be dying out. Um, would you stand up for me for a second? Sure. And just come around there, and just like that, just there for me. That's great. You can take your hand. And just rest that there. Excellent. That's great, and you can just stay like that for a while while I show you what this is. I'm going to show you something involving 
this, which is a doll. But the thing about uh, this doll is that it, it, it doesn't, as it is, it doesn't have a soul. So we need to give it a soul for this to work. And that's what I'm going to do now by taking this. Are you happy if I use your ring for a second? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Just allow that to sort of go floppy down there. That's great. Thank you. And the ring goes into the center here. And this makes it a soul for the doll. Just like that. Now it has a soul. And your soul, if you like. Stay there for a second for me. See, I just think it's interesting for me that we tend to believe what makes us feel good. If we decide that something is nice or makes us feel nice, that we decide that it's true. Which, you know, you could argue devalues the idea of truth terribly. Can you feel anything at the moment? What are you aware of? Um, my legs feel really heavy. Can you move them? Can you move your feet? <laughs> Nope. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. You see? You can't move them. You can move your arms, yes? Yeah. Just flap your arms a bit for me. Just do that. Thank you. Just so you can see you can move them for a moment. And then watch. What happens now? Can you move your arms? No. You trying? Yeah. OK, now look at me. This will be perfectly comfortable, all right? There's nothing unpleasant about this. Perfectly comfortable. I just want you to count. Just try and count all the way backwards from 10 to 0 for me, out loud. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 5, Put that close. Can you talk? <clears throat> See, for me, it's all about questioning, I think, and not taking things at face value. Like, at the moment, you can't speak, but the only reason why you can't speak is that you believe that you can't speak because of what I'm telling you. And the interesting thing is that if I tell you you can speak, all that does is give you permission to question that belief, and then you find that you can speak. Can't you? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Because what we believe isn't necessarily real at any level. I mean, this certainly isn't, it's not even a real voodoo doll. You know, and even the real voodoo dolls we used uh, for healing, not for not for putting curses on people. But what I did, I got you to invest in that belief, and one of the ways I got you to do that was by investing something of yourself in it, like your ring. Whereas, in fact, there's nothing in there. There is no ring in there. I didn't put your ring in there. You know, your ring's still on your hand. <laughs> yeah? You all right? <laughs> I did see him taking the ring and putting it into the doll. I, I can't explain it. He asked me to start counting and I just couldn't open. I couldn't communicate. I just felt my feet and my legs become very, very heavy. Um, as if they, they were just blending in with, with the ground, basically. It was a really bizarre feeling. When I actually looked down and I saw my ring on my finger, I, I could not believe it. And I still can't believe it right now. <laughs> I'm, um, I don't know how that's happened. <laughs> I feel really weird right now, actually. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> After the break, I entertain this lot and show you how I like to relax. A lot is said about children having stronger psychic ability because they're so unjaded and innocent. 
This excruciating view of children is generally expounded by people who think like children and perhaps can be forgiven. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Very pleased to meet you. Thank you. Now, you know that your headmistress, Miss Davis, was going to come in here and just check that you were all going to be well behaved. She can't do that because, as many of you probably know, she can't be here today uh, because her pants fell down earlier on. Uh, it's not funny. If you see her, don't make it fast because it's a little bit embarrassing for her. Okay? All right? It's not funny. <laughs> In fact, perhaps a little boy at the back, if you'd like to give these back to her, if you see her. <laughs> if you can't be behaved, I'll have to give them back to her myself. Right, Amy, got something I'd like you to do. All right? I'm going to give you this, which is... A story, okay? Now, this is a story that was written by my niece, Macy, who is seven, all right? It is rubbish. <laughs> You're going to read that out loud, okay, a few times. And what's important as you do this is that you need, in your mind, to have a, a picture of something while you read it out loud. That's a little bit complicated to think of something while you read out the story. But I want you now, as I talk to you, just to allow some image. And while you read the poem, uh, read the story, to allow an image to form in your mind in front of you like that, sort of from the back of your mind to move forward. But I don't want it to be influenced by anything that's in the story itself, uh, nor by the pictures on the outside. Does that make sense? Yep. All right, so, can you all come round here for me? Can I put some uh, aprons on you and give you some paint? Okay, you're all sat very nicely. Thank you for that. So listen very carefully so you all understand what we're going to do. Amy's going to read a story. You have to listen really carefully to the story while we do this. While she does that, you're all going to make a handprint picture on this big sheet of paper. And while you do it, no talking's allowed because you've ought to really listen to the story that Amy's talking to you about. All right? Off you go. Would you like to read for us, Amy? Near the biggest tree that ever grew by the fence down by the duck pond lived a duck called Dan. He decided he hated yellow. I really hate my beak. It's unbearable. Boo-hoo, he'd sob. Everyone in the forest glade actually made Dan a red beak to wear, and he was happier. The end. Near the biggest tree that ever grew by the fence down by the duck pond lived a duck called Dan. He decided he hated yellow. I really hate my beak. It's unbearable. Boo-hoo, he'd sob. Everyone in the forest glade actually made Dan a red beak to wear, and he was happier. The end. <laughs> Near the biggest tree that ever grew by the fence, down by the duck. OK, stop, guys. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for reading that horrific story so many times. Thank you all, and very well done. You were brilliant. Um, just a second, just stay there for me while I just talk to Amy. Shh. How are you doing? Enjoy the story? Um, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, let's just, just show it to me for a second. While you were reading that out, um, you were focusing on a, a, an image, you were thinking of something That's in your right. head. That's right. All right. Uh, and obviously, just for the record, you hadn't told me what that was going to be or anything like that. That was no. just something you did as you were doing it. Was it in any way influenced by any of the things on this page? No. Not at all. It no. was just something out of nowhere and just in your head? Yep. There is no possible way that I could know what that is right now, is there? I would have thought so, no. Is it anything like that? <laughs> well done. Is yep. that what you were thinking of? Yep. Come with me. Let me show you this. This will take a little leap of faith on your part. Okay. All right? I realise that's just a massive brown paint. Just take a look at it as a whole. If you're a moment, we just ignore this corner here, which has all gone a bit wild and a bit mad. Just imagine oh, no, that. No, 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 I can see. Can you see it? That's slightly freaky. 
the two legs, arm coming down there, and all that corner yeah. there's another arm there, the body and the head is even facing there as well. It's a teddy bear. That's freaky. Well done kids, you were brilliant. Was it fluke for the children or did they pick something up? I tried to think of something that I thought the children would, it would be easily recognisable to them and something fairly soft around the edges really. So, and it was, e it was easy to think of. I have no idea what the connection was at all and why some of the words were written big or spaced out. I don't understand what that's about. Amy, thank you for doing that. You're welcome. You were a little bit freaked out by that and you were asking how on earth it was done. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do something I don't normally do, which is sort of explain a little bit of what went on there. Brilliant. You probably know this off by heart now. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> and uh, you've really said that you, know, you don't feel anything in there was possibly giving away what you were thinking of or you weren't influenced by anything in this, correct? That's right. Okay, so the drawings around the outside, nothing there that would uh, suggest a teddy bear? No. No, okay. Apart from maybe, if you like, three of these are brown. The only animal, the only thing there that isn't brown is this animal up here. If it were brown, it would probably look a little bit like a classic teddy bear pose. Perhaps. Right. Maybe. I don't know. You've also got the word unbearable right here in the centre, with the word bear there, right in the middle, maybe. Yeah. Um, you've got a little bit here that says red beak to wear as part of the story. And you can see in red and beak the K of the word beak, perhaps maybe suggesting an R sort of shape that would reflect the word wear there. So that could be a reflection of the word bear. And red, the R, they're looking a little bit like a T. Maybe that might suggest Ted, bear, perhaps. What about up at the top here? Big word at the top. The N of near could possibly look a little bit like a B, the way I've done that squiggle. Perhaps you could, yeah. be, you could possibly be looking at the word bear there. How about this? Take the first letter of every line. T, E, D, D, Y, B, E, A, R. Teddy bear. Yeah. Yeah. Take the last letter. T, E, D, D, Y. B E A R. The lines begin and end with the word teddy bear. If you take a diagonal on that page, T E D D Y B E A R. <laughs> <laughs> T E D D Y B E A R. And if you go right down the centre, T E D D Y B E A R. And you were thinking of a teddy bear. You were absolutely superb. <laughs> That's fantastic. You're fantastic with the kids. <laughs> it was a real pleasure doing that with you and with your class. So thank you very okay. much indeed.
Ugh. <sighs>